today. Uh, Jim is presenting on Cedric Price, the journalist, and please join me in welcoming Jim. Hey, um, I have the uh, uh, task of trying not to wrap it up, I think, because there's so many um, doors and windows have been opened, so I'm going to open another window, let's say, and so we can continue this conversation. Um, so thank you for this invitation. This is really a very special event. Um, for my contribution to this afternoon's uh, chat, as Kenny Price might have called it, um, I'd like to focus, as the title has already suggested, on uh, I think really a pivotal aspect of his work, which uh, still tends to be largely overlooked, which is uh, Price's discourse. So um, it may be argued, and I think with some of the quotes that have come up, that it, whether it's in the form of these very memorable phrases like uh, technology is the answer, but what was the question, or these uh, uh, anecdotes like uh, the one where um, Price convinced a couple to uh, get a divorce rather than build their house. Uh, in a way, this course it has been really, uh, in a way, extremely influential and highly inspiring in his work, and perhaps maybe uh, on the same level as his uh, design work, if not more. So I'm looking at, um, in a way, the craft of his words, in a way. And, um, and whether it's spoken, written, recorded, typed, transcribed, archived, uh, collected, edited, copied, or cut and pasted like uh, this image here, um, really this was something very important to Price. This is, a, I find an interesting image. It was a collage that I found, uh, let's say, a text collage I found in the archives of his notes around 19, uh, in the 1990s, so uh, very closely before uh, his office archives were moved to the CCA. And if you look closely, it is a collage of a series of uh, recopied uh, quotes on time, the topic of time, um, that he photocopied. In fact, there are several copies at different sizes, and that he inserted and overlaid on an on a, a excerpt of a, a text of his own from the 1980s on a style for the year 2001. And it's kind of uh, interesting in this sense that he created a kind of conversation in a way between different, uh, let's say, uh, actors, different people who he invited to talk with himself, uh, Price, Price and Bacon, H.G. Wells, Jeffrey Vickers. And in a way, this is something that uh, it really interests me, this kind of continuous dialogue, as he once put it. So words were uh, an integral part of uh, Price's design philosophy, but it was also uh, not just a way to reflect on architecture, like a historian or a critic, he was a critic as well, but as a design tool, as a technique, and in a way, I started thinking that I was going to look at his discourse, and in a way, you find that it's really intertwined with his design work. For example, these questionnaires uh, from the Fun Palace, so it really is also something of a design tool which is uh, very much in keeping with this idea of being uh, interactive about a collaborative process. There's another image, for example, of uh, another um, chart where uh, the participant indicates what possible activity combinations uh, may or may not be compatible uh, in their opinion. And another, um, let's say, um, favorite device of price was audio cassette tapes. Um, so all, all these kind of, let's say, tools for design that we might not think about, uh, uh, words, but sometimes spoken words, this was a kind of uh, material voicemail that uh, Price used to record conversations with his client, this one from the Generator Project, but also comments and observations sometimes, afterthoughts, when he was not able to come in person. Sometimes he would put a cassette tape, you would hear it, for example, on the table of one of his collaborators in the office, but he could not be there, so a bit like Samantha's uh, a sketch overlay on when the drawing sometimes he would put a cassette tape and you had to listen to his comments of what, when he was not there. Um, so one of the form, most formative as uh, Kim uh, suggested and productive influence that I'm very interested in is his, uh, uh, his work as a journalist as my title uh, suggested and typically in the hierarchy of let's say architectural discourse architectural journalism is somewhere at the bottom of the ladder. And um, indeed, architectural historians often, and critics, relegate the architectural journalists to the role of a neutral agent, uh, observer, who simply communicates and records information without comment. But media theorists and historians argue that reporters make stories, and that the making, quote unquote, of stories involves critical investigation, interpretation, and imagination. So this is something that I'm working with precisely this engagement with media and a form of what I, I'm calling critical proximity 
that, in my opinion, makes the case of price highly relevant today as a model for repositioning architectural discourse. So in other words, I wish to look, um, for example, today at Price's engagement with mass media and journalism as a critical project, per se. Price's first uh, professional engagement with journalism was in 1960, the year he founded his architectural office. So he was hired to write a new independent television series on architecture. It was called Angle. This is an excerpt from the script of one of the first programs. And Price went on to act as a consultant uh, and broadcaster for various television and bro radio broadcasting companies, including the BBC. So indeed, from the very beginning of his career, you might say, Price took the habit of writing in multiple voices, and in terms of the immediacy of the spoken word, so sound, as you see here, timing, image, action, were therefore equally fundamental and fundamentally interrelated. This was also significant on a symbolic level since for pop critics and artists alike, television was the symbol of the post-war electric age. This is an image of uh, Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian media theorist, who was a key influence on Price. Price made recurrent references to concepts from McLuhan, uh, for example, the distinction between hot and cold media, cold media being more participatory in its definition, use, and operation. Now, it's interesting, McLuhan referred to his literary style that consisted of aphoristic texts uh, like textual fragments, often inquisitive or provocative in nature, as a form of writing in progress, or an open text in which the writer and the reader were co-producers of meeting, of meaning, an open-ended process like a conversation. And he already observed in 1951, and I quote, the whole tendency of modern communication whether in the press, in advertising, or in the high arts, is towards participation in the process, rather than apprehension of concepts. And this is very much like Price's approach. Another key source is the Victorian novelist Charles Dickens. Although Price's love of Dickens is well known, often one often overlooked connection, and which is particularly relevant here, is that Dickens is Dickens' activity as a journalist and reporter. At the age of 19, Dickens entered journalism as a parliamentary reporter. He excelled covering debates and published his first text as journalistic sketches of everyday life. But many of Dickens' major novels, uh, like Price's favorite, The Pickwick Papers, that you see here, were only later published in, serial, uh, in book form. Throughout his career, Dickens published his stories in serial form, either in weekly episodes uh, uh, in the magazines or as monthly installments in the penny press, even synchronizing the timing of the story's events to report the passing months of his readers' lives. So in this way, Dickens sought to bring his stories closer to the here and now of his readers' lives, generating anticipation of each new episode uh, as part of the everyday life of his readership. Dickens thought about his novels through the serial format of the news. So serial form is also a very salient feature of the manner in which Price structures his own discourse. Whether it's his work for television or radio, his public lectures, for example, had very often s several parts to them, and his involvement, of course, in architectural magazines. So this example, a series of monthly features known as the Cedric Price Supplements that Architectural Design published in the early 1970s and in which Price presents a number of his unpublished projects and texts accompanied by a personal commentary. So it's a kind of serialized monograph, a bit like a Dickens novel, and it has an added design feature that the reader had the possibility of detaching each supplement so he could order the material like a do-it-yourself book. Now, this also echoed, uh, I think it's important, wider changes in the transformation of the information industry. The introduction, for example, of feature supplements, so he's making reference to this in British newspapers, first appeared in the Sunday Times in the early 1960s, and it became a widespread phenomenon by the 1970s. This was re related to larger social transformations, that, such as uh, free time, as uh, Tanya has mentioned, which significantly boosted 
newspaper readership, and notably on weekends, when reading became a popular leisure activity. So Price's serial discourse is best, for me, epitomized by his writings as a columnist, and I'm going to focus the rest of my talk on his columns. Now this is one slide from his very, um, one of his first weekly columns in the mid-1970s. So it's an activity that he would renew repeatedly until the end of the 1990s. Now the column as a recurring article or piece of opinion journalism in newspapers is a feature of the post-war newspaper world. At the same time, its roots lie in the 19th century, the era that witnessed the birth of commercial news and the serial literature of Dickens and that corresponded to a shift towards quote-unquote softer forms of journalism. And it's interesting also it's been called infotainment, but the very first British columns uh, that appeared in newspapers consisted of collections of short stories. So increasingly over the 20th century, however, columns became known for their trenchant, sorry, um, trenchant uh, criticism, particularly of society and politics. Now this is one of the most successful columns of the 20th century, which was uh, the William Hickey column, which was published in London's Daily Express starting in 1933. It was named after an 18th century diarist and libertine. Um, the column was produced, however, anonymously by Tom Driver, who later became a Labour MP and party chairman and, significantly enough, was one of the principal supporters of the Fun Palace. It was Dryberg who introduced Price to the theater director, Joan Littlewood, and who was the initiator, as has already been talked about, the Fun Palace project. Dryberg's column marked a turning point in column journalism. Due to its unusual mix of social gossip and critical political commentary, anticipating, in effect, the rise of soft news and feature articles that would become the hallmark of 60s newspaper journalism. Now Price ran nine different columns, sometimes in segments, in two different London-based architectural magazines, Building Design and Architects Journal, over a period of almost 25 years, from 1975 to 1999. Now this is Price's first column, which accompanied uh, an exhibition of his drawings at the R.I.D. Heinz Gallery, hence the uh, title, and the high title Heinz Extension. But this was probably a reference to McLuhan's bestseller, Understanding Media, the Extensions of Man, not to mention the more obvious uh, architectural meaning. But it was possibly also, um, since Price was very fond of wordplay, uh, another reference to continuing education programs, or what was known at the time as extension lectures, which were addressed to a broad public ranging from sixth six form high school students to old age pensioners who often could not access higher education due to their social and economic status. This is a, an announcement, or one of the announcements of this course he did on modern architecture for, uh, you imagine, an audience, a very mixed audience with school children, and some of them also published articles in the newspaper about our picture in their own town. So Price's column can therefore be understood as a part of a broader agenda that sought to move architectural culture into closer interaction with society, but whereas his work in continuing education, like here, can be seen as a way of re-embedding architecture within a more democratic society, his work as a columnist can be interpreted as something of the opposite, a way of re-embedding society into the discipline of architecture. Building design I find interesting because it's not your typical design or trade magazine. Indeed, it was something of a hybrid. So I just want to say a few words about this magazine, which was very important because that's where Price began his columns. It was a weekly magazine, unlike the more academic or professional journals, um, like Architectural Review or Architectural Design that came out on a monthly basis. It was therefore more in tune with newspaper journalism, but also to the politicized left-wing uh, weekly journals of opinion like New Statesman and New Society, to which Price and his friends like Rainer Banham uh, contributed. It therefore had to be fast, responsive, and cost-efficient. Um, it had a very interesting model, and Peter Murray talks about it, and which is very coherent in, uh, let's say, Price's journalistic aspirations, 
And that is notably uh, the tabloid newspaper. The tabloid newspaper is a hybrid format somewhere between newspaper and magazine, which is focused on soft journalism and gossip. And that would become the apotheosis of the British popular press. The tabloidization, let's say, of building design took place under the leadership of Peter Murray, a close collaborator of Price, who repositioned the journal as a distinct counterpoint to the more hybrid or highbrow journals of the UK scene. And Murray, who had formerly edited the Clip Kit series of, of student publication for which Price was a mentor, uh, had worked as a technical editor at AD before coming to building design and notably invited Price to do the supplement series. As Murray explains in an interview, building design was essentially conceived as a newspaper aimed, and I quote, producing fast news, which was easy to read and easy to throw away. And this, according to Murray, was due to a staff composed primarily of professional journalists, Price and himself being uh, notable exceptions. Uh, and he commended the professional journalists that they tended to get news out fast, faster, avoiding the obscure jargon of the profession. So it is clear that Price really considered himself more of a journalist than a theorist or a scholar, let's say. For example, in this article from AD, he calls himself a US snoop, which is a term used by journalists to character characterize investigative reporters. Price's columns were composed of a montage of several elements like letter correspondence, critical commentary, news, anecdotes. I'm just going to talk briefly about two elements, starting with the anecdote. So anecdotes are um, short narrative accounts of an amusing, uh, revealing, or interesting uh, uh, story. Um, they're often combined with other material to support an argument. And in fact, anecdotes are not only um, um, all through his columns, they are also uh, in his archives. And there's full of anecdotes. And for example, this one where he playfully adds a headline as a kind of playful gossip or commentary. And I find anecdotes a very interesting device that uh, Price developed because it was not only to make a point or an argument, it was a way to humanize his discourse, to narrow the distance toward his audience and his objects of discussion. The anecdote allowed Price to render experience on a more human level. Anecdotes were also a literary vice that en interested the Marxist literary um, critic philosopher Walter Benjamin when he was working on his um, never completed arcades project. And uh, Benjamin was also interested in the profound effects of mass media. And he, uh, this is the quote that I have here, which you are, are reading. He developed a concept of nearness as a possible strategy to recover uh, what he saw as a kind of um, distance that had been opened up due to mass media in the language of experience. So this kind of lost intimacy and immediacy of unmediated experience. And as you, he, he writes here, the anecdote was one of those devices which can bring us closer, not to that as an abstract history, but something very material that we could make it kind of closer and not come into that space, but bring it down to the space of the reader. So that the reader was very important in that. So the correspondence with readers also was very important. That's the second point I want to make about the columns, is that letters intrigue Price. He reflected, for example, on one of his favorite history books and, and speculated that one of the, the successes of this history book was that it was not written for public consumption, but merely for private commentary in the form of numerous letters to a close friend whose opinions and comments the author welcomed and respected. So some of the columns have invited this kind of uh, readership to write letters. And it's also interesting that Benjamin admired very much this uh, idea of, uh, of, of um, I would say, storytelling, where there is a sense of community or companionship. Benjamin, for example, writes in his famous essay, The Storyteller, a man listening to a story is in the company of the storyteller. Even a man reading one shares this companionship. And indeed, one of the... Um, particularities of column journalism through its regular correspondence with everyday actuality, whether it's polemical, enthusiastic, or sarcastic, is its ability to forge a sense of community um, with its readership. And Price, for example, not only responded to readers' remarks or critiques, but he also posted questions and requests 
from, with, from uh, his readers. For example, this uh, reader wants to have advice on Christmas gifts for architects, the reader being uh, not an architect. So, uh, And there's a lot of different exchanges like this, of this nature. And I think it's very interesting. Benjamin mentions that, in a way, um, one of the, let's say, uh, features or characteristics of stories is that they always contain openly or covertly something useful. In a way, it is practical knowledge woven into the fabric of everyday life. And these columns, in a way, really speak of that. And Price's columns, trivial everyday matters, are in effect intertwined with more serious issues like politics or professional reforms. And this proximity to his audience um, is very important. But this does not mean consensus. Price was known to be uh, very much a uh, very principled and uh, left-winger, a trade union member, and he enjoyed, in fact, uh, the company of people who did not agree with him. And I think that's a very important point also. For example, this letter where uh, someone writes in saying that, uh, uh, commenting on the appalling uh, level of his letters, uh, or standard of his letters. So, as like all of his... Um, readers, the identity is only indicated by an acronym of his uh, initials. But with a very cursory reply from Price, uh, you suspect that this is not uh, a stranger. And in fact, indeed, uh, this was uh, someone that Price knew very well, uh, Norman Willis. He was the train union uh, leader and general secretary of the Trades Union Congress at the time. And in his final column, Price lets his chief editor, Paul Finch, unmask so to speak, Willis in good humor by suggesting in an editorial footnote that you see here, um, in a friendly dispute, maybe we can persuade a Norman Willis to uh, begin the column. So just to conclude, um, one interesting um, thought about the column uh, journalists is that they were often hired to have a more subjective voice and sometimes to be really um, somehow uh, independent from the editorial line of the proprietors. It was a kind of a, a very special, uh, let's say, status within the newsroom. So in a way that was it's something I think that's very important for Price. But a kind of interesting story about uh, his letters, Paul Finch claims, is that um, in the letter exchanges, no one ever did write in the claims Paul Finch. Paul Finch claims that Cedric invited all, invented all the questions himself. And in this respect, one could consider Price as a literary journalist. That is in the tradition of Dickens and other Victorian novelists. That is literary journalism, which regained popularity in England and the US in the 1960s and 70s, is a form of creative spectatorship and performance transposed to writing that draws on the idea of theater as a defining metaphor. So in a way, these columns, and this is the last series of columns that he did, the Price Cuts for Architects Journal, is in a way a kind of fictive stage for contemporary society, for the, the play of society. And in a way he re kind of invents this kind of tradition of uh, what I'm calling oral literature. So I'm going to stop there with that story. But in a way, if I would want to conclude this idea of the journalist as a kind of modern day storyteller, it's as much about um, not only um, sharing tales, but it's making those spaces that you can share those tales. Thank you very much.